looking forward to talking to you tomorrow. We'll be at the dining room table and we'll be broadcasting on uh, not a radio station, but live streaming on jeremycordo.com, 9 o'clock until 12. Interesting guests and all sorts of things happening. I've got an interesting fellow for you to meet tomorrow. He's, uh, he, uh, he runs a jet, uh, what would you call it? What do you call those things, Pete, where you sit there and you, you're in the cockpit and you're doing Simulators. the... Simulator. Simulator, yeah, yeah. And he, he runs this jet simulator experience. I don't know how Tony Denton, who uh, is the man responsible for putting our live streaming technology together, he would understand it. <laughs> in fact, I think he's got his own... Um, simulator in his, in his shed. <laughs> well, it's probably a lot simpler than having the aeroplane. Uh, yes, but that's, that's on Friday, but a whole lot of other stuff. I hope you will join us. JeremyCordo.com. And don't forget to call. I'll just give you the number if you want to make a note of it. Got a rotten memory. 0491 65 68 60. Okay? 0491 65 68 60. And you talk to not just me, but, you know, the whole world. Because we get calls from absolutely everywhere. Quite amazing. Now, I heard this the other day the lack of diversity. Diversity is one of those buzzwords these days, isn't it? Diversity. The lack of diversity on our boards, you know, our corporations, boards of directors. And I, I, I listen to all of this, lack of diversity. Not once did they mention the quality of directors. It was just diversity. Actually, you don't need diversity on a board. You need experience and talent. But oh no, 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 no. The ABC says that we need diversity. We need, keep in mind they didn't talk about qualifications at any point in this story. The ABC says we need more women, more indigenous and queer people. We need diversity. A lot more disabled people. I would have thought, unless it was a company or something associated with disability, I couldn't see the point. Because really, what you want is able people, not disabled people, on a board. Isn't it? Or am I totally wrong? Lots of disabled people they want. Their big complaint is that 91% of positions on company boards are held by people who are Anglo-Celtic. 91%. Well, okay, so what? Anyway, I mean, sort of pointing that out is fairly racist in itself, isn't it? Now, I'm assuming in the normal events, you know, the, a normal situation, people are elected to a board. Board directors face the shareholders at regular AGMs, you know, annual general meetings. You know, there is, there is no limit to the stupidity of the left. And of course, it's loudspeaker, which is the ABC. Quite bizarre. I mean, if you, if you think what I'm uh, saying is totally wrong and, and, and uh, you want to rip my ears off tomorrow, you can do it. Call me. I welcome you to do it. But I don't think I am. I mean, I've, I've owned companies and I've had boards of directors and what I always looked for with that board was experience and talent, knowledge, wisdom. Tell me if I'm wrong. 
But I'll tell you where there is a lack of diversity. Parliament. And I'm talking about most of the parliaments, federal and state and territories. Most of those people who sit in the parliaments of this country have never had a real job. That's of great concern. I would also suggest that they've had very little life experience. And I'm talking about both sides of politics. It's too narrow. They're, they're drawing people from a very narrow area of society. Staffers, advisors. Well, that's how a lot of those members of parliament started out. That's their apprenticeship, if you like. They don't represent the people, of course, the electorate. It's the party. It's the ideology they represent. That's not how it started out, you know. When the Liberal Party started out, for example, in the 40s, when Menzies put this party together, they had hundreds of thousands of members, grassroots sort of stuff, a lot of talent to choose from. Labour mostly drew its talent, its candidates, from the trade union movement, <coughs> and they worked their way up through that means. But these days, when you look at the trade union movement, and, and most of the uh, people, including our Premier here in South Australia, Peter Malinowskis, uh, it came from the Shoppies Union. Most, most of these people <coughs> these days on the left of politics come from the trade union movement. And when you think that only 13% of workers belong to a union, I don't know how representative that is or how diverse that is. But it should always be that whether you're Liberal or Labour, if there's somebody up there saying something you don't believe in, you have the freedom of thought and you have freedom of speech, particularly in a Parliament, to stand up and say, I'm sorry, I know that's not what my party stands for, but I, I'm going to cross the floor. Well, if you, you try that... Now, I think the Liberal Party will let you cross the floor, but if you cross the floor, the Labour Party will sack you. I think that's the story. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. They have been trying for years to get people to move to smart meters. I don't know whether you get your electricity bill monthly or quarterly, but more and more people are suffering from bill shock as they open that dreaded envelope. Well, I suppose these days a lot of people get their bill uh, as an email. <coughs> and it's of particular importance if you have a so-called smart meter. The reason is that more and more electricity is provided by these people who are applying time of day metering. Time of day metering. Watch out for that. Meaning that if you don't know, you could be using electricity at the most expensive time of the day. Now, I've said no to a smart meter time and time again. I won't have a bar of it. But remember, regardless of how they measure the power and how they charge for us to use it, it is the doing of this labour, renewables, obsessed government. It's the ideological obsession with renewables that is to blame for all of this. We now find out that we have a shortage of gas. We have a shortage of gas? We're the biggest producers of gas in the world. And they tell us now that there is a shortage. And we will probably have to, at great expense, buy from overseas to cope with the shortage. And all of this, for what? Our emissions are minuscule. 1.3%. 
This government is agonizing over a problem that doesn't exist. More importantly, it is causing us to agonize over a problem that doesn't exist. But what is the difference? If we burn the gas, or somebody else burns the gas, gas is still burnt. But these clowns in Canberra can't grasp that, can they? Amazing. Cow's milk. Uh, not something I think a lot about, but it, the, uh, the story caught my eye. Cow's milk, cow's, cow's milk is apparently okay for babies, but not before six months of age. Now, I never heard that before. I never knew cow's milk was a problem for a baby at any age. A lot of women have trouble breastfeeding. I know. Now, I, I guess there's, uh, there's uh, formula, baby formula, which would be fine. Now, I, I'm, I'm no expert in, on, on the subject. Well, yes, I am, actually. Uh, I am. Well, my mother told me I was. <laughs> or I qualified as an expert on breastfeeding. You see, uh, I'll tell you the story quickly. Um, she couldn't wean me. She couldn't, couldn't get me off the breast. I simply refused. And when she tried several times, I just refused to eat nothing. So she had to put me back on the breast. How smart was I, Pete? <laughs> I'm intrigued by this. <laughs> I just refused to leave. Now, my mother used to tell me that she, I was, I, she fed me till I was four. I was four years old before I finally accepted the inevitable. What about you, Pete? Do you remember? Oh, I've got no idea, mate. You weren't told? <laughs> I know. Well, it probably wasn't an issue with you. <laughs> but anyway, I loved my mother and I loved being breastfed. Not that I can actually remember it. But um, anyway, I don't think it was all that extraordinary in those days. I remember talking to Julie Morosi. Julie Morosi was the, uh, the wife, well, maybe not the wife. I don't know whether she ever married Jim Cairns. He was the uh, um, uh, communist uh, former treasurer in the Whitlam government, Jim Cairns. And uh, uh, she and, uh, well, Junie Morosi and Jim Cairns were quite a story in their day. Not so many years ago. Anyway, I can remember Julie Morosi telling me in an interview, happily, that she had breastfed her son till he was 11. 11! You know, you, I just I have this picture of a kid coming out from school, <laughs> throwing his case on the bed, <laughs> having a trick. <laughs> anyway, believe it or not, believe it or not, I couldn't even imagine that. But according to this story I started out telling you about, cow's milk is fine from six months and older. But let me tell you, I, I, I believe breast is best. You know, it's not only the right temperature, but all of the um, advantages, nutritional advantages that come from breast milk. But it's not always easy, and it's not always natural. Not, not everyone takes to it. Uh, and that's from my experience of having four children. A lot of issues. Uh, if you're a, a, a woman and you struggle too, for one reason or another, breastfeed, it can be terribly painful. And there's the guilt if you can't do it, and you feel you should. Now, a woman can feel that she is the only one to be suffering this kind of thing. Now, there was a great system in the past, a great facility, I suppose you'd call it. It was the clinic, the clinic, the baby clinic. Every second suburb had a baby clinic. They were great. A qualified sister or nurse was there at certain times of the week. They would weigh the baby. They'd advise you on just about everything involving the baby. Uh, a fantastic resource. It worked remarkably well. Why that stopped, I don't know. Oh, well, for God's sake, of course it stopped, because it worked. You know, I mean, you, you, if you're of a certain age, you'll remember baby clinics. They were very, very good. 
very useful, very appropriate. Don't know. Um, time's getting away, Pete. Yeah. The, the drive, the drive, if you will pardon the expression, for more charging stations for electric cars leading up to the next election continues. The truth doesn't matter. I won't say they are a failure, electric cars, but I consider them a, a risk financially, a risk and an expense with little or no resale value. Yet, of course, if you tell a lie often enough, people are going to believe you. This government is telling you lies about electric vehicles at public expense, of course, and the media is helping them do it. I bet they won't mention the problem with insurance or repairs or the electric vehicle on North Terrace last Saturday, just this last Saturday gone by, that burst into flames. A totally ideologically driven argument and policy. And not enough questions being asked by the media. Again, I have no idea why. People wonder, I know I do, why there are so many scams and people falling for so many scams. They're everywhere. And then I look at some of these electric car sales statistics and stories and whatnot. Uh, not many car sales, I think it's about 8%. But they talk it up, of course they do. But like scams, in the face of warnings and information, not that you're getting a lot about electric cars in that department, people will still be taken in by scams. If you're interested in an electric vehicle, do me a favour, do you a favour, ask questions, demand answers. You will not get much help from the media, but it's really up to you and it's up to me. I better leave you with some dates. Have you got some music for us, Pete? Oh, well, I thought I might play one of my songs. Yep. Um, my first attempt at a video, so it's pretty ordinary, but the song's nice. Oh, what's the song? Never Be Mine. Oh, Never Be Mine. I like that. That's one of my favourites. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Did you ever sing that when you came into Deckers, or that was way before you wrote it? Uh, what? Never Be Mine? Yeah. At Deckers? Yeah, would it would have been in the 80s. When did you write Never Be Mine? Oh, way after that. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Now, we're up to the 11th. The year is disappearing, Pete. Yes. 1970, Apollo 13 was launched to the moon. Unable to land on the moon, it returned six days later. And the world held its breath and Hollywood made a movie. Good movie too, actually. The Apple One computer, created by Steve Wozniak, is released on this day in 1976. Well, that was the beginning of the popular concept of the household computer. Mm. Uh, Ethel Kennedy, American human rights campaigner, wife of Bobby Kennedy, was born in Chicago, Illinois, one of the most charming ladies I've ever met. I went, uh, it was Christmas Eve when I was in America, and I went to uh, uh, Bobby and Ethel Kennedy's uh, lovely old farmhouse outside Washington. I think it was Virginia. Um, it was called um, Hickory Hill. Lovely white weatherboard farmhouse. Not, not big or anything. It was, you know, just a lovely, lovely family home. And she was a wonderful host. Hostess. Anyway, she was born on this day in 1928. Uh, 2013, Jonathan Winters, American comedian, dies from natural causes at the age of 87. In uh, 2013 was the year. First modern submarine designed and built by John Philip Holland is purchased by the U.S. Navy on this day in 1900. 
Golly. Uh, on this day in 1996, actor Hugh Jackman weds Deborah Lee Furness. He was 27, she was 41. I think they've split, haven't they, Pete? I don't know. I think they have. Um, yum, 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 yum. Ronald Reagan arrives home from hospital after the Hinckley shooting. Well, Hinckley tried to shoot him. That was in 1981. I remember he saying to his wife, sorry, I forgot the duck. <laughs> uh, 2007, Dynasty, or as the Americans call it, Dynasty, and T.J. Hooker, actress, Heather Lockyer, 45, divorces rock star Richie Sambora due to irreconcilable differences. They were married for 11 years. She was a pretty girl, wasn't she? Heather Lockyer. Uh, the trial of Adolf Eichmann for war crimes in World War II begins in Jerusalem, Israel, 1961. Halley's Comet makes closest approach to Earth this trip, 63 million kilometers, but we couldn't see it through the clouds. In 1986, and one last one, Jeremy Clarkson, English motoring journalist, broadcaster, TV presenter, Top Gear, Grand Tour, born 1960. Oh, he's only a kid. He was born in 1960? Goodness me, he looks older than that, doesn't he? Huh. Anyway, we'll leave it there, and I do look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much for being with us in the Court of Public Opinion. Now, jeremycordo.com, three hours, live streaming, all sorts of fun and games. You never know. Actually, I haven't got a lot planned for tomorrow. So we'll, as they say in show business, fly it. <laughs> Take care of yourselves. Believe in yourself. We'll, we'll be back with the uh, podcast and the Facebook page come Monday. Believe in yourself and goodbye for now.
I'll say I love you in a song. 